So we are, we are concluding a series today that, if it's your first time here, that we have simply titled A King's Tale. And our, our goal this Christmas is to tell the story of Christmas, not in a micro fashion, but in a macro fashion. By, by that I mean when we tell the story of Christmas, usually we, uh, we talk specifically about his birth in Bethlehem and all of the events surrounding his birth. And this year, we've decided to tell the entire story of Christmas from beginning to end, from creation to consummation. So if you've been here during the month of December, we started in the book of Genesis, and we talked from the Old Testament about the fact that a king is coming, and we saw that, that the purpose of all of the events of the Old Testament was pointing towards the king who would come. The second message in the series was on that empty page in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. As we studied those 400 silent years, and we talked about that there was a purpose, even though God was silent, God was completing, God was fulfilling his plan. Last week, Brad did a tremendous job of talking about the Gospels and the fact that the King had come. When Jesus came, he came not just as the incarnate Son of God. He came not just as a Redeemer and not just as Savior, but he actually came as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so today's message is going to be not your traditional Christmas message because today we're going to finish the story. And our, our theme today is simply this, the king is on the throne. And today we will begin at the death of Christ, and we will move forward through the New Testament to our lives today. And so I really want to challenge you to examine yourself this morning and ask yourself this question, is Jesus on the throne of your life? And we'll ask that question as we conclude the service. So would you begin with me with a word of prayer today? Father, thank you so much that we can come together as a church family. Father, thank you that we can worship you during this Advent, during this Christmas season. Thank you that we can focus our minds and our hearts and our attention on Jesus. And so, Lord, our, our prayer today is that we would go beyond Bethlehem. Lord, we would go beyond the stable, beyond the manger, and we would see that Jesus, that little babe who came in a manger, is none other than the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, during this Christmas season, help him to worship him in that fashion. Lord, as today as we begin at your death and we move forward, help us to see the purpose of your coming, of your birth. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So for the followers of Jesus, it had been a very difficult weekend, the weekend of his death. They had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. The weekend began on a high note with Jesus' entry into the city. His disciples, Jesus' disciples, hoped that this weekend would be special. Would this be the time, they wondered, that Jesus declared himself the long-awaited king, that Jesus overthrew the Roman oppressors, and that Jesus established his kingdom here on earth. You remember that Israel was depressed as a nation. They had been under Roman oppression for several years. And on top of that, they had not heard from God for over 400 years. There had been no prophetic word. There had been no miracles, no angelic appearance, not one signal, not one proof that God was still with them. And then all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, this, this man, Jesus from Nazareth, appears on the scene. At first, the people merely watched him and listened to him with interest. He was a, a point of interest, a spectacle, if it were. 
But soon crowds began to follow him from place to place. The people were fascinated by his teaching. Why they said, we've, we've never heard anyone teach like him before. And then there were the miracles. No one could deny the fact that the lame walked and the blind received their sight. In the beginning, the people looked upon Jesus with suspicion and doubt. But the more they heard him, the more they were convinced that he was more than a prophet. And then, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he was received by a passionate, enthusiastic crowd. He rode in on a donkey, and, and the people laid out their coats and laid out palm branches and cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Oh, they were convinced this was the Messiah. This was the long-awaited King. He had truly come. But in just a few days, their emotions changed from joy to sadness. Their political and their spiritual hopes had been dashed. Why, they were sure that Jesus was the Messiah. But then unexpectedly, he was arrested. He was judged as a common criminal. He was crucified and he was buried. After Jesus' death, the disciples huddled together, fearing for their own lives. They had been so confident. He was the long-awaited king. They had left their jobs. They had left their homes. They had left everything to follow him. And now, he was dead. He had been in the grave for three days. It seemed like it was all over. As his followers, what were they to do next? No one had an answer. No, no one knew what to do. On Monday morning after the tragic event, several of the women disciples traveled to the tomb to anoint the body, as was their custom. Let's do this quickly, they must have thought. No telling if the plot to kill Jesus involved his followers as well. We might be in danger. And so they quickly traveled to the tomb. But when they arrived at the tomb, they immediately noticed something different. Something was odd. The massive stone which had covered the grave was rolled away. And as they walked in, the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was gone. For a few moments, they just stood in the tomb, perplexed. Did someone move Jesus' body? Could those Roman soldiers have, have taken it and placed it somewhere else? Suddenly, there, there were two men who appeared to them in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and they fell to the ground. Who were these men? Were they the ones who stole Jesus' body? Strangely, one of them asked, Why are you looking for the dead? Or why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Jesus isn't here. He is risen from the dead. At that moment... They remembered. There was something that clicked in their mind. They remembered that Jesus had talked about rising from the dead. The ladies rushed back from the tomb and shared the news with the 11 disciples who were huddled together. The 11 were immediately skeptical, so Peter and John ran to the tomb as fast as they could, John outrunning Peter. As they arrived, they saw something that was inexplicable. The tomb was empty. And the burial garments which had been placed upon Jesus were folded and laid to the side. Why, it appeared as if Jesus had just gotten up and walked out of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, one of the ladies, was overcome with emotion 
And after Peter and John had raced back to join the rest of the disciples, Mary lingered there at the tomb. As she stood weeping outside of the tomb, suddenly there was a man standing beside her. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked. What are you looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, Mary responded with a broken heart, Sir, sir, if you have taken his body, please tell me where you have placed it so that I may go to him. Jesus simply said her name. Mary. We don't know whether it was the tone of his voice, whether it was the way he said her name, or whether it was the look on his face, but Mary immediately recognized him. She cries out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. For 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus made eight supernatural appearances to his disciples. He appeared to Mary here in the garden. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to Thomas. And several times as the disciples met together. In total, Paul tells us that he was seen by more than 500 people alive. Yes, Jesus, the promised the Messiah, the one who they had seen die on the cross, was alive. Jesus was alive. The Messiah was alive. The king had won the victory over sin. He'd won the victory over death. And he had defeated hell. There in those 40 days, he told his disciples that he had been given all power that he had been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and then commanded his followers to make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them to obey all of his commands. He then challenged his disciples to take his messages, to be his witnesses, and to go out from Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, and all around the world. After saying this, a cloud came down and picked him up. And like a heavenly rocket ship, it ascended him up into the heavens as they watched until he appeared out of sight. Once again, an angel appears to them and asks a seemingly dumb question, why are you gazing up into heaven? The response probably was, well, well, we've seen Jesus go. We're waiting for him to come back. And the angel said, yes, this same Jesus has the part, who has departed will come again. Go in peace. Some would assume that this is the end of the story. Jesus had come. He had lived. He had fulfilled his purpose. His job was done. His mission was complete. He now could return to his divine, royal, and worshipped existence from which he came. Jesus is gone. The story is over some would think, but nothing could be farther from the truth. You see, Jesus may have ascended out of their sight, but he did not disappear out of their lives. After the ascension, Luke tells us that the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy. How is it that the disciples who previously had been disturbed by the talk that Jesus would leave them, they had been troubled by the fact that he would leave them alone. How is it that now they are joyful 
now that Jesus had left, now that he was already gone. Evidently, they knew something, they understood something now that they did not understand before. There, there was a new realization, there was a new understanding of who Jesus was and what he truly wanted to accomplish it or accomplish. Peter makes mention of it on the day of Pentecost when he preaches his great sermon in Acts chapter 2, verses 32 through 36. Peter says this in his sermon. He said, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. Notice this phrase, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David didn't ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Peter says this, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God hath made both Lord and Christ, Jesus, whom you crucified. Did you catch it? Realizing that Jesus was king. <laughs> Realizing that he wasn't just the man, the miracle worker who worked, walked among them. But realizing that Jesus was king. That he was seated on the throne at God's right hand. That they, as his followers, were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that they were his representatives these disciples now lived with new found confidence. Acts reports that they did four things. I kind of just gave you an outline today if you want to write these down. First of all, they worshiped with passion. Their worship was invigorated Read the book of Acts. They now were not worshiping just an incarnate son. They now were worshiping some who had overcome sin. They were watching someone who had overcome death. They were worshiping someone who had risen from the dead. <laughs> Their worship was impassioned. They shared with generosity. The things that they claimed as their own, they now were willing to give to others. Oh, they, they prayed with confidence. They, they were praying not just to a transcendent God who they did not know. Now they were praying to a God whom they knew personally. A God whom they had seen demonstrate his power. And they witnessed with boldness. You see, they were witnesses to the fact that God was at work. Jesus' departure wasn't the end of the story. It was the beginning of the story. God was at work demonstrating his power, building his kingdom, drawing people to himself, and enlarging his church. The work of God had not finished. The book of Acts is filled with examples of God's Amazing, supernatural power. Acts chapter 2 tells us how Peter preached a powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost. And 3,000 new believers were added to the church in one day. Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 relate how the early Christians sold their houses. They, they sold their possessions. They sold their lands and they brought the proceeds to the apostles to help meet the needs of others. And Luke tells us that their generosity was so successful that there was not found a needy person among them. Acts chapter 5 recounts 
the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. Seeing how others had been lauded for their generosity, this married couple came with a scheme. Somehow in their warped mind, they developed a scheme to get the credit for giving sacrificially without actually sacrificing. So they sold a piece of property, but then lied about how much profit they made. They acted as if they gave the entire portion to meet the needs of others, but actually they kept a certain amount for themselves. God was not pleased. When Ananias pretended like he was more generous than he actually was, God instantly killed him. And just a few hours later, when his wife continued, when she verified the lie, God killed her as well. Can you imagine what their deaths did to the early church? Could you imagine if someone in our congregation lied to God, acted like they did something that they didn't do, took credit for what God was doing, and God killed them in our midst? Can you imagine how that would create a a greater reverence, a greater fear, a greater understanding of who God is and what God is able to do? That's what took place in the early church. Well, as you can imagine, the church continued to grow. Hundreds of men and women and children became followers of Jesus Christ. The gospel of the kingdom spread beyond Jerusalem. And now, for the first time, Gentiles, non-Jews, were added to the church. Don't be fooled, though. Not everyone was pleased with the growth of Christianity. The, The Jewish religious leaders began to persecute the Christians or the followers of the way. They arrested them. They sent them to prison and even killed some of them. One day, the most ruthless persecutor, a man by the name of Saul, was traveling to Damascus looking for more Christians to arrest when all of a sudden a brilliant light surrounds him. And he alone hears a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul, uncertain who he was speaking to, uncertain where the voice is coming from, cries out, who is speaking to me? And the voice replies, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. Well, as you can imagine, Saul's life was never the same. And Saul ceased from being a persecutor of the church to becoming Paul, the preacher of the gospel. And throughout the rest of the book of Acts, Paul starts 14, at least 14 churches and writes almost half the books of the New Testament. You see, Paul saw Jesus He saw the risen Christ. He saw the king and his life forever changed. Tradition tells us that later the majority of the disciples, Paul and the other 11, demonstrated their commitment to the king by giving their lives for him. James was stoned to death in Jerusalem. Paul was beheaded in Rome. Peter was crucified in Rome. Tradition says upside down. Andrew was crucified in Asia. Thomas was pierced with spears in Syria. And we could go on and tell unbelievable stories about what happened to the rest of the 11. What what changed in those men's lives that made them transform from ordinary fishermen to powerful preachers, to people who were giving, who were willing to give their lives for what they believed. What changed? They recognized Jesus as king. 
Not just as the incarnate Son of God, which was high and, 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 and powerful enough, but they recognized Him as King. They had an encounter with King Jesus, and their life was never the same. As a result, they dedicated such allegiance to Him that they were ready to obey, they were ready to serve, And they were ready to die for him. Today we can continue the king's tale through the rest of the New Testament. We could trace the tale of King Jesus through the early years of the church. We could talk about the story, the tale of Jesus through the dark ages, through the Reformation, through the Enlightenment, up to the modern era. You see, the story of Jesus the King is an ongoing, ongoing story. Once upon a time is not just something that happened someplace, somewhere in a distant future. But the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is at work in my life. He's at work in your life. He's at work in your family. He's at work in Hollywood, Florida. You see, the king's tale is a story that is being told through your life and through mine. So you may ask today, Brian, what does this have to do with Christmas? What does... What does maybe especially what we talked about today, have to do with Christmas. Please catch this. The simple truth is, it is very easy for us to worship Jesus as a baby. It is difficult for us to worship him as king. Would you let that sink into your mind and heart? It's easy for us to worship him as a baby. It's difficult for us to worship him as king. You say, Brian, what do you mean? When we worship Jesus as a baby, we walk away moved, but not changed. When we worship Jesus as a baby, we feel emotion, but not allegiance. When we worship Jesus as a baby, we can become a Christian but not a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, when we we keep Jesus in the manger, we fail to see him on the throne. And I'm convinced today that there's many people around the world who will celebrate the story of Christmas with good intentions. And this Christmas, they will worship the baby in a manger but they will not recognize him as king. And Jesus did not come to earth to be a baby. It was part of God's plan. It was part of God's existence. I'm not denying that. I don't don't minimize that. But he came to be king of kings. And he came to be Lord of lords. To truly understand Christmas is to know that Jesus is worthy of our praise. To truly understand Christmas is to know that he is worthy of our sacrifice. To truly understand Christmas is to know that he is worthy of our witness. Even when our family and friends don't get us and don't understand us, he is worthy of our witness. To understand Christmas is to understand that he is worthy of our Life. This Christmas, Jesus is on the throne. This Christmas, he is king of kings, and he is lord of lords. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 1. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you which are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? According to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ. Notice this phrase. When He raised Him from the dead and did what? Seated Him at His right hand. Where is that? On the throne. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Oh yeah, we believe that Jesus will corporately reign here upon the earth one day. And we talk about that as if it was only a futuristic event. But I submit to you today that Jesus today, this morning, in Hollywood, Florida, is on the throne. And he is reigning. He is reigning today. So let me ask you a really personal question. This Christmas, how do you view Jesus? How do you view him? Is he just a baby in a manger to you? Or is he your king seated on your or on his throne? You see, that that truth transforms our life. It changes us from being Sunday Christians to being seven-day Christians. It changes us from, from keeping the majority of what God gives us to saying, okay, God, everything I have, everything I own is yours. It gives us boldness and confidence in our prayer life. It helps us to boldly share our faith with others, even in a hostile world that doesn't want to embrace Jesus as king It emboldens us as it emboldened the disciples to be his witnesses. Why? Because as they said, we have seen him alive. Our hearts are changed. Our mind is changed. Yes, he ascended up into heaven. But this same Jesus who ascended up into heaven one one day will return. And we as his subjects, we as his followers, today, December 23rd, 2018, recognize him as our king. That's what Christmas is about. Is Jesus your Would you stand with me today? Jonas and the praise team are going to come. We're going we're gonna to finish the service a little bit different today. We're going to service, we're gonna finish the service taking the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to ask if our elders and deacons would take their places and be prepared to serve the Lord's Supper in just a few moments. As they prepare, as our praise team prepares, would you do, would you do me a favor? Would you prepare your hearts? Would you examine your heart right now? Here's a couple of questions that you can ask yourself this Christmas. Number one, is Jesus my Savior? Has there been a moment in my life when I have recognized who he is? I've recognized who I am, my depravity. And as a result of that, I have confessed my sins to him. And I reach out to him as my only rescue my only hope, and I reach out to Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. If you've never done that today in, the heart, in, in your heart of hearts, you can become a follower of Jesus Christ by simply, in your own words, asking Him to come into your life, recognizing the, the, the fullness of His gift for you, and embracing His forgiveness. I can't think of a better thing to do on Christmas. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brian, I've already reached that point in my life where I recognized my need of Jesus. So you might say today, I recognize him as my Savior, but I still don't recognize him as my Lord. I still don't recognize him as my King. 
Would you examine your heart today and just do a little bit of business between you and God? If there's unconfessed sins, take it right to the throne. Confess it. Prepare your heart so that in just a few moments you can take these elements with a pure heart, with conviction that you are a follower of Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I want to pray. and When you're ready, I'd encourage you to come and grab a piece of, of, of cracker or wafer and a juice and take it back to your seat with you and we'll partake of this together. Brad's going to come in just a second and lead us together as we take the Lord's Supper. Would you pray with me today? Thank you for the truth of Christmas. Thank you that you created us, you placed us in a world, you gave us dominion over it. And yet, in our failure, we took the wrong path. We worship the wrong thing. We allowed idols to come in our life that took our focus off of Jesus. And we sinned. And we lost what you had originally intended for us to have. But thank you that Jesus took upon human flesh, came and lived the life that we cannot live, and died so that we don't have to die, and allowed us to once again to be brought into a proper relationship with God the Father. We worship you today. There's someone here that has never made that decision in their heart of hearts. May today be the day that they give their heart to Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, this Christmas that you would move us beyond, beyond worshiping the babe in the manger and help us to worship the king on the throne. May you truly be king of kings and lord of lords in our hearts this Christmas. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.